Welcome back everyone. This will be our last video for lecture 35, which turned out to be on a little bit of the long side here. Um, we'd seen previously how with a sequence, there is no notion of tangent line, but we can still capture some ideas about optimization and monotonicity for sequences. Sometimes we can borrow the derivative uh, if the function can be con extended in a continuous differentiable way. But we've also seen that sometimes the, the sequence approach can actually be more efficient. Um, I also, in this, in this video, I want to demonstrate a technique which can be useful for computing the limit of a recursive sequence. Uh, because in this context, recursive sequences might not have a natural extension to, um, to a continuous or differentiable function. And this is going to be based upon what's known as the monotone convergence theorem, which basically says the following thing. If we have a bounded function, so there's some value on top that the function never surpasses, and there's some value on the bottom that, again, the function never surpasses. We have some maximum value, capital M, and some minimum value, little m. I'm not saying the function actually touches these values, but we know that it's bounded between these values. It never gets above capital M, it never gets below little m. And also, if the sequence is monotonic, meaning it's, it's always increasing or it's always decreasing, then the monotone convergence theorem says that the sequence must converge. And the proof is basically the following illustration. If you're bounded between these two values and your function is increasing, it can go up, 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 right? But there's sort of a limit, right? You can't just keep on going up forever. Your rate of increase kind of has to slow down with time. And at some point, you're going to taper off at some value. And that value um, is going to be the limit here. So we get some limiting value. So if the function is bounded and monotonic, then it'll always, always, always be convergent. So let's see an example of why that might be useful. Let's investigate the sequence a sub n that's determined by the recursive relationship that the base case is a1 equals two. So that's where it's gonna start off. And then we have the relationship that the next term in the sequence, a n plus one, will equal one half a n plus six whenever n is greater than or equal to two. So if you look at the first couple of terms of the sequence, well, let's see those. Uh, we'll, we'll build a chart here. So we have n and a n. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, that's oftentimes enough to see the pattern here. So it says it starts off at two. So if we look at a two, we're gonna plug two into this machine right here. You're gonna get two plus, two plus six, which is an eight. Divide that by two, you're gonna end up with a four. Uh, which is the next term in our sequence. Record that here. To find a3, we're going to plug 4 right here. You get 4 plus 6, which is equal to 10. And then 10 over 2 is going to give you 5, which we put in as the next term in our sequence. You get a 5 right there. Uh, the next one, if you plug in 5, you're going to get 5 plus 6, which is 11, divided by 2 gives you 5.5, uh, which we record here for a4. 5.5. Uh, the next one, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more careless on the, the calculation here. If you do A5, you're going to get 5.5 plus 6 divided by 2. That's going to give you 5.75. Then if you take 5.75 plus 6, uh, that gives you 11.75. Divide that by 2, you're going to get 5.875, like so. And keep on going with this. We'll do just a few more terms. If you do the seventh term, uh, that would give you 5.9375. If you do the eighth term, that's going to give you 5.96875. And then lastly, if you do the ninth term, that would give you 5.984375. So we can see that the initial term... All right, if we look at these first couple terms here, we can see that the term appears to be increasing. It seems to be an increasing sequence, and it seems like it's increasing toward the number six. So we actually have sort of a conjecture that maybe six is the limit of this sequence. But how do we actually prove that? Because we've seen examples in, in this course and also in, in calculus one where a numerical estimate, although helpful, can be deceptive, right? How do we guarantee that the limit is in fact six? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a technique that's referred to as mathematical induction. Um, it's a way of making sense out of patterns that are given by these limits or by these uh, sequences. Particularly, how can we find the limit of this thing? Mathematical induction. 
Uh, so induction is a method we can use to prove things about sequences. It has three important parts to it. Uh, so first, there has to be some type of base case, right? We have to show that at some point, the statement is true, right? So if we want to show that the sequence is increasing, we have to be like, okay, it increased, it increased at some point. Um, and so for this one, we could say something like A1 um, is smaller than A2. Notice here that A1 was, A1 was in fact 2, which is less than 4. So this is a base case that it starts off increasing. Great. Then the next step... Now the next step here is what's often referred to as the inductive hypothesis. The inductive hypothesis. What we're going to do here is we're going to assume we're going to assume it holds. Assume the statement holds for a n. So in that context, what we mean here is that we're going to assume, right? So we did our base case for this. So we're trying to show that the sequence is increasing here. So we showed the base case. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to assume, assume that a n minus one is greater than a n. And because the idea is if we, sh if we showed one is less than two and then two is less than three and then three is less than four, four is less than five, assume we've got up to this point, that a minus one, it will be less than a n, okay? And so then the third ingredient of our induction argument is we then have to establish the next case. This is sometimes referred to as the inductive step. Uh, we have to then, thirdly, we use the inductive hypothesis to show uh, the statement holds for a n plus one, the next term in the sequence. And so what we have to do is we have to then show that a n is less than a n plus one in our sequence. Uh, and so we, and we do this using the assumption that we had from before. And so before we proceed in this, in this I kind of want to give an analogy that imagine we're setting up a bunch of dominoes, right? We have a bunch of dominoes uh, in a sequence like the so and maybe you see something like this on YouTube or something. Uh, in order for a domino sequence to fall over and be some awesome display, there's two ingredients basically. First, someone has to push the first domino over. That's our base case from before. But then also the dominoes have to be sufficiently close together so that when they fall, they will knock the next one over. And so that's what we're trying to do with this step right here, that if we push this domino over, it'll knock down the, the next one in our sequence. So for our sequence here, how do we show that it's increasing? Remember, our recursive relationship uh, looks like a n plus 1 is equal to 1 half a n plus 6. So we're going to use this, we're going to use this statement to try to prove this. And so we're going to assume, remember, we're going to assume that a n minus 1 is less than a n. Great. So what we do is we're going to start with this statement. A n minus one is less than a n. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add six to both sides. This tells us that a n minus one plus six is less than a n plus six, all right? And then we're gonna times both sides by one half. One half times a n minus one plus six is less than one half a n plus six. Now the right-hand side, one half a n minus one plus six, that's equal to, by this formula right here, this is equal to a n. And then the right-hand side, 1 half a n plus 6, like we see here, this is equal to a n plus 1. And so we've been proven by induction that our sequence is, is increasing. See, that wasn't so bad, right? We took our assumption and manipulated it until we got the statement we wanted to. And this proves us that our dominoes fall over one by one by one towards infinity uh, if we were to continue in this manner. So our sequence is an increasing sequence. We've now established that it's increasing by, by um, induction here. So that's an important thing to mention. So if we were to switch the question up, is our sequence bounded? Is it bounded? Well, because it's increasing, we know that a n is going to be greater than or equal to a sub 0. Or I should say a 1 was the first term in our sequence, which is 2. So this gives us that it's bounded below.
because if you're if you're increasing you will always be bounded below that's automatic but is it bounded above that one's a little bit harder and again we're going to use we're going to use induction to help us out here so for our the first the base case our con, our, our following statements can be the following a1 is less which itself is equal to 2 is less than 6 Remember, six was the number we think is the limit here. And so we can then show that, okay, the first term of the sequence is bounded above by six. The second step is we're going to assume, assume a n is less than or equal to six. All right, so that was easy. And the third step is we need to show that a n plus one is less than or equal to six. And how we do that is typically taking the assumption we had before and manipulate it, remember? Kind of like we did it before. A n is less than or equal to 6. So let's add 6 to both sides. 6 plus 6, that's equals to 12. Um, times both sides by 1 half. You get 1 half. A n plus 6 is less than or equal to 12 over 2, which is equal to 6. But then the, right -hand, the left hand side, excuse me, this is just A n plus 1. And so this then establishes what we were looking for a n plus 1 is less than or equal to 6. And so Bob's your uncle there. We've now shown that this function is, in fact, it's bounded above, it's bounded below. Therefore, this function, this sequence is bounded. And so why is this important? Well, remember how we started this video with the monotone convergence theorem? By the monotone convergence theorem, we see that the sequence a sub n is convergent. we see that the sequence is convergent. That is to say, that is, a n has a limit. Now it has a limit and we suspect that that limit is six. We, our claim here is that still that the limit is equal to six. Now be aware that the monotone convergence theorem does not tell us what the limit is. The monotone convergence theorem tells us that a limit exists. And because the limit exists, we still have to compute what it is. Now our claim is six and it's a pretty good claim and I wanna show you um, what, how, how we actually prove it now. So important observations the following. If we take the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, this is equal to some limit value L. This will also be the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus one. That is, if we just start one term later in the sequence, their end destination is still gonna be the same thing. And so we utilize that in the following calculation here. Um, take the recursive sequence, the recursive relation, a n plus one is equal to one half a n plus six. We are then gonna take the limit as n goes to infinity on both sides. So take the limit as n goes to infinity on the left and on the right. Well, on the left-hand side, it'll converge towards L, whatever that limit is. And by limit laws on the, on the right-hand side, we're gonna get one half times the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, and we're gonna add six to that, which again, the right-hand side is gonna become one half L plus six. And so now we just wanna solve this equation for L uh, times both sides of the equation by two. Uh, we do this to cancel the one half on the left-hand side, or right-hand side. We get two L equals L plus six. We're gonna subtract L from both sides. And then we can see exactly what we we're looking for, that this limit is equal to six. So it's exactly what we claimed it to be. Now, when you look at this, we look at this example here, one might be tempted, might be very tempted to, uh, to, to, to wonder, why did we have to go through all this process? I get how we took the limit of both sides on the recursive relationship and we were able to solve for the limit and get six. And so that actually justifies why the limit was six along the way. But one has to be very careful because this step right here uh, if one's not careful, it could be done erroneously. Because when you're doing this step, you take the limit of both sides, you're assuming, you're assuming that A sub N is convergent. You're assuming A sub N is convergent. Otherwise, this calculation would be completely meaningless if the sequence wasn't convergent at all. And so then, assuming it's convergent, you would drive this, the limit has to be a six. But what if the sequence is divergent? If the sequence is divergent, this, this same equation would lead to six, but the limit's not six if the sequence is divergent because the sequence is divergent means the limit doesn't exist. So this calculation is only valid if we know the sequence is convergent. 
And the problem happens that there can be divergent sequences which are recursive, that if you apply this idea of taking the limits of both sides, you end up with a number, but that's not the limit because it's divergent. We can only do this calculation if we know the sequence is divergent, and that's why the monotone convergence theorem was necessary. And I wanted to mention this because there's a lot of kooky videos online on YouTube for which people are proving bizarre things like pi is equal to four, or the harmonic series is equal to, what is it supposed to equal to, like two thirds or negative three halves or something absurd like that. How are they getting how are they getting these completely false statements like the harmonic series, which is divergent? How could it possibly equal a number? It doesn't, right? The issue is they're, they're using techniques for convergence theories on divergent sequences and thus getting these erroneously ridiculous statements. Then people are like, ooh, it's magic. No, it's not magic. It's just incorrect mathematics. So in order, so finding the limit of a recursive sequence is pretty easy because you just have to do this calculation. But be aware this technique only works if the sequence is convergent. If the sequence was divergent, we potentially could find a limit that is not correct. So be cautious about those.